Once again, this is Dick Thornburg reporting with a story that will shock and amaze you about just how far a man will go for fame and fortune. While the aftermath of this morning's daring raid on the Townsend Art Museum is still being felt, I have uncovered the bizarre life behind one of its main perpetrators. Our story begins here, in the small town of DeKalb, Illinois. Self-conscious of his immigrant heritage, Jack Frontslavsky changed his name to Frontier and joined the Army at the age of 18. Frontier had an affinity for action, and it wasn't long before the CIA had him in their sights. Yes, our government used your taxpayers' money to train this man into a skilled and lethal operative for the best part of 10 years. But Frontier eventually grew bored with this lifestyle and quit the service. Craving something more fulfilling, he recorded an exercise training video. The result was called Train or Die, a militant aerobic routine to get those perfect abs. Yes, only in America, ladies and gentlemen. Train or Die was an overnight success, and the name Frontier became synonymous with training the rich and famous. Yet even this wasn't enough for the fitness freak. Frontier wanted to star in the very action movies he helped train people for. Eventually, he got his wish in Galaxy Thief as a Martian space mercenary. The film was a surprise sleeper hit, and soon Frontier found himself reprising his role in the inevitable sequel, Galaxy Thief 2. This time, the film bombed. Many critics specifically targeting Frontier's performance, stating that not even an alien would ever act in such a wooden way. For Galaxy Thief 3, the studio wasn't taking any chances. This time, they cast heartthrob Greg Castle, hanging Jack Frontier out to dry. Forever shunned by the Hollywood elite, Jack Frontier sank into a miserable depression, once attempting suicide. The table was truly turned, ladies and gentlemen, from being toast of the town to the most wanted man in Hollywood after this morning's vicious attack. Yet another tragic tale about falling stars and shattered Hollywood dreams. How far will one man go for his 15 minutes of fame and fortune? This is Dick Thornburg signing off for HEN, where show business is your business. Man, you look awful. A little white wine and some food, and then a night at the opera. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, I'm Dick Thornburg reporting live for HEN, the Hollywood Entertainment Network, where show business is your business. It's a beautiful day in Los Angeles and I can see the whole city from atop the Townsend Art Museum. Art patrons, city officials, and various other important LA personalities have gathered to witness this occasion. Piet Gruber, the son of the notorious criminal Hans Gruber, has returned to the city where his father met his demise. Piet, however, is here to return a painting recovered from one of his South American expeditions. Gruber maintains that this generous gesture is not a way to clear his family name, but an act of conscious art preservation. Gruber! Well, we're here at the presentation ceremony, which is just about to begin. Townsend curator Christoph von Leben is getting ready to speak to this excited crowd. Look at my Lucy. First day on the job, following in her old man's footsteps. Thank you all for joining us today as we return this wonderful work to its rightful place in the Townsend Art Museum. We've waited a long time to retrieve this piece, and we are so lucky that Mr. Piet Gruber rediscovered the Jacques through his dealings in South America. We'll let Mr. Gruber do the honors as he unveils the Jacques and hands it over to me as Townsend curator. Okay, Buzz, get some shots of the guests. The more skin, the better, if you know what I mean. Wait a sec. Isn't that the fitness instructor guy over there? Mm, frontier something or another. The guy with Gruber. It is with great pleasure that I give to you the Jacques masterpiece, Lakeside Nymphs. I've been assured by Mr. Von Leben that it will be rehung in its proper place and very well protected. Sure you have. But what about the thief that stole it? How were you able to obtain the painting so easily? We are very close to the perpetrator of the crime. I can assure you that the culprit will be brought to justice. What the... 
What the hell was that? Hey, buds, are you getting this? Gunshots? Lucy! Uh, everyone remain calm. There's, there's nothing to be alarmed about. And I always thought art was boring. This is Dick Thornburg live, and what started out as a lovely summer day has erupted into a maelstrom of blood and bullets. Buzz, are you getting this? I am risking my life here. Hey, Al. John! John! You're okay. I thought we'd lost you there. Yeah, I'm fine. And I've got some good news. Oh, yeah, what's that? You bringing me some donuts? <laughs> Close. Listen, their missile's not going anywhere. It's been deactivated. All right, cowboy, you did good. A nice time, and the governor was about to have my ass. I'll put a stop to the cash and over. Wait, Al, don't hang up. You gotta stall him. Gruber might not know yet, and he's got Lucy. We can use this to our advantage. And four, cowboy, I'll take care of it. We'll do our best to stall him. You just get your ass over here. All bets are off, Gruber. McLean sabotaged the rocket. What? No! What does it take to kill that man? I don't know, but if you've got a backup plan, I suggest you implement it now. I'm on my way over. Ah, uh, John McLean. I've been expecting you. I'm sure you will appreciate the irony in my choice of location. This ending here where it all began so many years ago, makes it all the more satisfying. Only this time, I'm afraid to say, it's your turn to die. Sorry, Gruber. I'm not planning on dying just yet. McLean, you are quite an irritating man and very hard to kill. However, this time, I'm afraid there is no way out. There will be no last-minute escape. I was going to allow you the opportunity to say goodbye to your daughter. But, seeing as how she will be joining you shortly anyway, what's the point? Fuck you, Gruber! You're a fucking dead man! Goodbye, Officer John McLean. Lucy, I want you to stay here. This is between me and Gruber. Dad, I was trained for this. I'm not your little girl anymore. Lucy, you're always gonna be my little girl. So just do this for me and stay here. Okay, but I'll be ready to go. Hold it right there, McLean. Any closer and I'll blow your daughter to kingdom come. Well, well, well. If it isn't Piet Gruber in the flesh. So this is it, Gruber. Go ahead. Take your shot. I'm the one you want. If you've got a score to settle, settle it now. McLean, this was never about revenge. My father barely said two words to me my entire childhood. You did me a favor by killing him. This is about money, McLean the money which you will now get for me. You and I both know I can't do that. Face it, you've come to the end of the line, Gruber. It's over. I warned you, McLean. Now you'll pay with your daughter's life. No, 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 die. Why don't you just die? Ah. Frontier, you goddamn coward. Come back here and help me. Nothing personal, Gruber, but you had it coming. Nah! Yippee Kaye, motherfucker. That's my girl. Thanks, McLean. You saved me a lot of aggravation. Sorry to leave you high and dry, but I've got a premiere to catch. This is a bad idea, John. Whoa! It's a really bad idea! Chief, it's Lucy. Gruber's dead, and his men have been taken out. Roger that. Man, you two made a mess. Get back down here. I want to meet you and John in five minutes. That could be a little tricky. Good evening once again. Dick Thornburg here, reporting to you live from the Holmes Observatory high in the Hollywood Hills. We're at the post party for tonight's premiere of Galaxy Thief 3. Greg Castle and his family have just arrived, looking relaxed and happy with the film's positive reception. Yes, folks, the Hollywood A-list has come out on this beautiful, starry night here in Los Angeles. Frankly, if you're not here, you're nobody. So stick with us and we'll be right back with Greg Castle himself in just a minute on HEN. <clears throat> What's 
Frontier doing Greg, here? can I call you Greg? Sure. What can you tell us about Galaxy Thief 3? You're going to love it. Lots of battles, lots of aliens, lots of comedy, even a little romance. This film is going to redefine the comedy space mercenary genre. And if we could genre. just talk about you... What was that? No! Nice work, cowboy. Another day, another building in ruins. <laughs> Congratulations, John. Thanks, Al. Where's Lucy? She all right? I'm fine, Dad. Just fine. Excuse me, are you John McClane? Who's asking? The John McClane? I'm Robert Barnes, head of development at Flyaway Pictures. I'd like to talk to you about movie rights. This is quite a story. Down and out cop saves the day with the help of his gun-toting daughter. Could make for a compelling movie. Thanks, but no thanks. Now, if you don't mind... Uh, maybe you're not hearing me. I'm willing to pay you big bucks for you your story. You heard the man. Now get out of his I'm face. I'm talking bright lights, starlets, big money. Don't be a fool, McLean. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How can I repay you? Well, you can start by getting out of my face. What the hell are you doing here anyway? Trying to get an interview with Von Leben. Exclusive, naturally. Tell me everything you know, and if you fuck with me, I will kill you myself. I heard them say that they've wired explosives to the two main entrance doors. They're booby-trapped. If anyone tries to get in from outside, boom. We'll have to deactivate them, but it's gonna take some time. Adios, amigos. John, look out. McLean. Oh, wait. Hold on. Don't do anything until I get the camera. John McLean. We meet at last. Dad? And his daughter. This is perfect. Grab her. You'll never get away with this girl. Oh, but I am. I am. Get her in the chopper. Lucy! Just a little insurance, that's all. I won't let Frontier damage her. Yet. You touch her, and you're a dead man! You hear me? Let's go. I'm right behind you, Gruber. What's that smell? 
What do you care, McLean? Oh, no care at all. It's just that being locked up in this cesspool isn't getting any better with you turning into a goddamn fish market. Tuna. Yeah, I recently acquired the taste. Don't suppose you could acquire a taste for breath mints? Hey, you're a real funny guy. Let's see how hard you laugh when Frontier busts me out. Face it, fish boy. They're done with you. Screw you, McLean. You think they're just gonna leave me in here with you? No way, man. When they get here, all hell's gonna break loose. <laughs> right. I'm sure that'll be happening any minute now. Think about this, muchacho. When you're rotting in here, I'll be with your daughter. Hey, McLean, what was her name again? Adios, muchacho. Where's Lucy? Where's Lucy? Holmes, eating tuna. Eva Quero. Looks like I get the last laugh. Done your time. Let's get you out of here. What's going on? Where are you taking the paintings? Well, Raven, do us all a favor. Shut up. You want me to be gone? This is madness. Let's go back. He's busy making some. Arrangements. Things have gotten out of hand, Frontier. The cops are on to us. I I've got my reputation to sink. Von Leben. He'll be well rewarded. Okay, men. Let's get these paintings out of here. Pumped up testosterone fueled moron. Don't you realize how serious this is? Who changed the plans? I'll let you get away with that once. Just once. And I'd ask yourself, what more do you have to offer us? I don't like anything about this. If I was you, I'd shut up and follow orders. Your usefulness is rapidly running out. That's my girl. We'll take Von Leben from here. Watch out for his European charm. You know I've only got eyes for you, Dad. If you know what's good for you, you'll tell her what we need to know. Get your hands off me! Get used to it. The next guy to hold you is gonna be your 300-pound cellmate. Nice detective work, Dad. Thanks. I'll catch up with you later. I got some showering to do. I wasn't going to mention that. See you back at the precinct. Is he okay? Yeah, he'll live. John, you shouldn't have been here. Look, Al, I can't sit around waiting to hear what's happened to Lucy. Yeah, well, you know that trailer you demolished? 
It contained Jesse Montana. Yeah, we met earlier. She's got a lot of clout, John. The studio's insurance company is going ape shit, and she's pressing assault charges. I hate to do this to you, man, but I gotta lock you up till we can clear this up. I need your badge and gun. Al, come on, Al. You can't be serious. I told you not to come here, McLean. You're too personally involved. Looks like you and Nitric are gonna have some more time to get to know each other. Just following up a lead. Lead? What lead? Probably nothing, but Nitric sure liked his tuna. Tuna? What are you talking about? I don't need you getting into any more trouble, John. Jesse Montana has dropped her charges, but you know it's not the first talk you stepped on. Hey, this isn't over until I get Lucy back. Look, cowboy, I don't have a choice here. But if you step out of line one more time, I'm taking you off the case. What was that last part, Al? You're breaking up. Stay out of trouble. Gruba, you've done it again. These paintings far exceed my collection from the Rouvre heist. I hope you find RDX-5 ample reward. Oh, I think so. Have you ever launched one of these? Gruba, treat it with respect. I wouldn't want to be within five blocks of that when it goes off. But of course, it's my baby, and I have some very special plans for it. It has been pleasure doing business with you. Ah, you're just in time to meet Sumi Kazawa. Sumi, allow me to introduce my associate, Marlin. Marlin and I go way back. We have what you might call a special Relationship. Had a special relationship. Now, we are strictly business. Exactly. It's a pleasure to meet you, Sumi. Ah, oh, an RDX-5. Marlin spent a lot of time in Russia, engaged in all manner of special operations. She knows her way around a big gun. Good eye. It is indeed Russian. It is fine rocket. I recognize the model. There's something... Beautiful about it, no? Hi, indeed. Time is tight. Welcome back. We have some breaking news regarding the Townsend art heist. This evening, the Century City Police Department recovered the remaining priceless paintings in an impressive raid on the city's docks. Although news of this retrieval will be a great relief to our city's many art lovers, this relief has now proved to be short-lived. In a shocking turn of events, Piet Gruber, son of the crazed robber Hans Gruber, has demanded one billion dollars from the city. If his demands are not met, Gruber promises to destroy the Los Angeles International Airport using a series of high-powered explosives. At this point, the preservation of human life is the primary concern of the police department and the FBI. We will, of course, be following the story closely on HEN, so don't go away. And now, a word from our sponsor, Jubilee Bright Toothpaste, because minty breath is just better. Drop your guns. It's over. <laughs> Don't be ridiculous, McLean. I'm not gonna ask again. You're too late. 
The ransom has been paid, and now I'm going to collect it. You so much as twitch, and I'll fill you full of holes. I don't think so. Not while we have your little girl face. It's over. You're finished. You and Gruber. Gruber? You think I care about Gruber? Ah, uh, McLean, once again, you fail to see the bigger picture. Marlin, look after our guest while I'm away. I'll be back with the money. Gladly. <laughs> You're too late. Lucy has no chance. Gruber will have his revenge. Where is she? He's taken her to where you killed his father. Nagatomi Plaza? He felt there was a certain poetry to it.
One of the things that um, these generation of consoles allow us to do, which we could never do before as games developers, is flesh out our characters a lot more than was previously possible. In Die Hard Vendetta, one of the ways we did that was by introducing a lot of dialogue to the characters. We wanted it so that if you went to speak to somebody, you'd get a reaction. But if you went to speak to them again, you'd get a different reply, and again, a different reply. And in doing that, in creating this dialogue, we actually gave these characters personality, uh, some of which will be very rude to you when you talk to them, some of them will be very helpful. Some of them, I think, you know, will make you laugh when you get a sarky reply back. What was that you said? yippee ki Motherfucker. From developing the personalities through the dialogue, uh, the art department could start to then paint the people. And they created the 3D models from the personality that was gained from the dialogue. From the design documents, there was a brief description of the characters. Uh, one or two lines, maybe a bit of about their background, a little bit about uh, what kind of work they do, whether these guys are, are bad guys or good guys. So from those few lines, I would go away, look at inspiration from movies, comics, and, and most importantly, real life. I actually went around the office taking photographs of uh, certain people that I felt had features that could be used to my advantage. Uh, for example, they might have an interesting nose or chin or, or forehead. I would go away, sketch out ideas, and give this guy a personality. Uh, if he was evil, I'd make his face seem dark, uh, give shadows under his eyes, certain features I'd, I'd make more pronounced. From that, I would take those images into Photoshop and then manipulate the image. This image now has to be mapped onto a, a 3D object. This comprises of two parts. There's a 3D mesh, and then there's the 2D textures that gets applied to the mesh. Uh, the 2D textures is pretty much like painting, uh, as you do in oils or acrylics. Uh, and the 3D mesh is like building something from, from material like wood. Once the texture was on the 3D mesh, the 3D mesh then had to have a skeleton, because without a skeleton, it can't move. So once the skeleton is applied to the 3D mesh, then we can actually run the animations through the mesh and bring the character to life. One of the key challenges for uh, Die Hard Vendetta was actually the, the sheer amount of characters that needed to be created. Uh, there's something like 130 unique characters in the game. The challenge was to make these characters as interesting and as memorable as possible. This is one of the characters in the game. Now, he's a, a prisoner that you talk to, so his facial textures have to be of a high standard. So once he blinks, uh, you go up to the character, you walk around him, his eyes will track you, looking left and also looking right. So once, we, once we've got the eyes looking left and right, we've got them blinking, and secondly is that we, we'd like to talk to him. Uh, so we, we've got the jaw flap, and you start talking. Uh, this works with the sound file, and uh, once the sound file is played through, through the engine, the character will start talking and he'll, he'll talk like this. Now, that's pretty blank. If he's saying something angry, we, we'd like to get some facial features in there. So, there we go. so we'd, we'd, we'd tint in his eyebrows, we'd, we'd give him a little bit of a, of a grimace, and then, uh, then we'd have him talking like this, almost like he's, he's growling or he's shouting. If he's a pleasant character, which he could well be, uh, we would give him a smile. And then if we wanted to make him talk, we'd take a little bit of the smile off and then, then have him talk like this. Um, so there's two emotions. We've got him angry, but then we've also got him happy if we wanted him to, to be happy. Previous to this generation of consoles, uh, the resolution of textures and the number of polygons was really restrictive. You would draw a character, you would get all the detail in that you think was needed, and then you'd come to the computer and the character was half of what you wanted it to be. What we can do now is the drawing that I, that I draw and the, the image that I have in my head, I can actually recreate that almost down to the finest details, which just was not achievable uh, on the previous consoles. McLean, you are quite an irritating man and very hard to kill. We wanted to add realism with regards to the dialogue and the speech you saw. We wanted to make the, the models look as realistic as possible and as detailed as possible because we could. Uh, with this technology. So the next thing was to look at the, the motion of them. We wanted them to move in a realistic way. And the way you get 
the most realistic motion is using motion capture. This is Bits's motion capture studio. And in here we capture the animations that we used in Die Hard Vendetta. Um, the system we use is a magnetic system. We've got two boxes, one here and one here. And what that does is it will track sensors on our actor's body um, for the various joints uh, around their limbs. Um, it's all been finely calibrated. There's like markings on the floor so all the distances and stuff can be translated into the video game. So the space here fits the space in the game. One of the reasons that we decided to go for a magnetic system is that it gives us instant feedback from the motion the actor's performing to us seeing it on a model within the computer. So in the development of Die Hard Vendetta, there was times when we decided that we wanted to change a scenario. We had the ability to come in here, create the animation, and within half an hour have it playing within the game engine. This allowed us a lot of flexibility in fine-tuning the set pieces. We brought in a stuntman who could actually perform many rolls and tumbles and was trained in the use of the weapons to give us the most realistic animations we could achieve. And unfortunately, we couldn't use metal weapons because it would have affected the uh, magnetic sensors. So we created a full batch of wooden M16s, pump action shotguns, uh, and numerous wooden props to allow them to perform the actions. When we began making Die Hard Vendetta, the first thing we concentrated on was the story that the game was going to tell. Um, it was very important to us to do the other films justice. Uh, so you get a certain expectation when you're told you're going to be playing a Die Hard game or you're going to see a Die Hard film. And we wanted to make sure that we lived up to those expectations. So we started focusing on what the story for Die Hard Vendetta would be. With the Die Hard films, you, there are certain things you'll get with them with regards to um, snappy dialogue, big set pieces, plot twists, and we wanted to incorporate all of these things into the story for the game. With that, we wanted to allow the player to be able to do things that you hadn't been able to do before. Um, first and foremost, you run around and you shoot things as is standard, but with the character of John McClane, we realised that a lot of what he does is creeping around. It's not just going in guns blazing. One of the first things we realized was we wanted to put in a stealth mode, which allowed the player to creep up on terrorist mercenaries. So we introduced uh, the stealth mechanic, which meant that you'd move around slowly, but you had a better chance of avoiding confrontation as opposed to every time coming in and having to shoot your way out of problems. Another thing that we wanted to do with the player was allow them the ability to interact with the world more than had been achieved before. And either that would be through talking to other characters in, in the world, in the game world. One of the mechanics we've got is grabbing, physically grabbing another person in the world. Uh, and that opened up a whole area of gameplay mechanics that hadn't been tapped into before. If he grabs the correct person, he can disarm a whole group of mercenaries. By taking out the commander, there's a chain of hierarchy, chain of command, and his henchmen will stand down. So this, coupled with the stealth aspect of the game, meant that the player had an alternative approach to dealing with all of these situations. We wanted to allow the player to have more flexibility in what they chose to do. One aspect of that was allowing the player to jump around, um, as opposed to constantly being tied to the ground. One of the mechanics problems that you have with that is if you're jumping, you don't want to constantly having to be look at your feet and see where the edge is before you perform a jump, because that is actually very frustrating for the player. So what we did was we, we came up with the mechanic of an auto jump, where if you ran at an edge, McLean would automatically leap. You want to keep the, the, the game flowing for the player, and the enjoyment comes out of making the jump as opposed to being in the right place to perform the jump. So again, it freed up the player to perform new actions in first person. One of the, the benefits of working in the video games is we can actually create and model things that you can't really do in real life. Or if you were to do them in real life, it would cost millions and millions of pounds. So for instance, what you expect from a Die Hard film is large explosions, uh, uh, buildings being destroyed. Uh, we, we had a lot of fun in being able to do that because we could create these set pieces of mass destruction. 
um, at a fraction of the cost to actually doing them in real life. And what is great for the player's point of view is they can cause this destruction, you know, um, but they don't have to pay for it. <laughs> Once we had the design in place and we knew the gameplay elements that we wanted to cover, um, we then had to obviously look and well, how do we go about building this? The direction we took was to, we spent a lot of effort working on the tools that we would use to build the world. What that meant was that we decided to build our own tool to allow us the flexibility to try different things out. Because a lot of the things we've, we've done in Die Hard Vendetta hadn't been done before. Um, so we developed a tool which allowed our level builders um, flexibility to build the worlds and the environments from uh, the concept art that the art department had produced but then actually play sections of the game within, within the tool. So yeah, we spent, we spent a lot of time and effort in, in creating the tool to allow us uh, to translate the paper design into a 3D world and play the game within the tool. And from that, we were, had the flexibility to see very quickly whether or not the, the space was right or whether it was, uh, the puzzles were working, the mechanics of it was working. Um, and it allowed us the opportunity to change things very quickly and fine-tune things to a degree. Um, if we didn't have our own tool, we wouldn't have been able to do. While well, I'm in here, I can play the general mechanics from what people will recognise as the start of the subway location. Um, now, what we can also do, because I'm running this within the editor, is I can take the camera away from where the player is and go and look at another specific point. Say back here, look at this uh, guy taking his trial. I can create a new view of that, just expand that out. I can keep doing this and then return back to uh, the player's perspective. You'll see another version of McLean that's just looking after the points back there. And we can test out various scenarios and see if the reactions are what we'd expect, you know, position wise. Various things we can do, we can slow down time, we can step through a frame at a time and just make sure that animations play smoothly, that sound effects and events are triggering at the, the correct time. Um, we can also get a number of debug information as well out for the programmers just to make sure that uh, everything is behaving as it should be. The sound department would be creating the sound effects for the weapons. One of the directions we wanted to do was go for a, quite a realistic style because obviously the films are based in, in a real world. So a lot of research was done on gun sound effects, <laughs> weapons, <laughs> explosions, <laughs> these kind of things. Um, and all these assets would be brought together within the tool to then see the paper design translated into a you know, playable game. Okay, so it's quite a big undertaking in producing a video game on this scale. Uh, we had five programmers working on just general mechanics. We had four 3D modelers making meshes for the worlds, uh, four level builders actually building the environments. We had a specific programmer working on audio, a specific programmer just working on AI. Um, so, so the actual production teams grew quite significantly because of the scope of the game. Uh, we, had, we had a big team already here. I mean, we had, I think, probably around 10 or 11 people already internally. That included writers, designers, Fox had a producer, exec producer, and I think a writer as well. They brought it onto the scene for a little while. So, but most of it was done in our offices in London with the feedback from Fox. The development time for Vendetta was now approaching two years from the start of the story to, to finalizing the game, which is, again, when you compare it to motion pictures, video games now are becoming equivalent to the production values and the production times as you see with movies. But the one thing that we do have with video games is you can interact with the world. And you play the story and the key thing that we really wanted to get across was that you felt you were in a Die Hard film and you were playing John McClane, but you could do things that you could never get to do in the cinema. You could actually go up and take a guy out. You could outrun a fireball. You could do all these things. We wanted the player to feel that sensation. I think that's the one thing that we've succeeded more so than on any aspect that we first started off was making the player believe that they were John McClane. One of the big decisions we had in, in the development of the game was whether the game should be mature. A lot of people don't realise the original films were mature films, 18 films. Obviously there was mature dialogue, some mature content. Um, it took a lot of convincing 
to convince the people around us that that's the way to go. We felt to be true to the license, you had to do that. And the feedback we're getting from for forums, potential customers, diehard fans, you can't make a diehard game and tr be true to it without being mature. So it was a big step that the decision was made probably at the beginning of this year, 2002. Uh, but it was definitely the right decision. I think it's a better game for it. It's more diehard for it. And I think everybody now looks back and is happy that it was definitely the right decision. It's always a great feeling when you worked on a project for a number of years to know all the efforts come through, it's on the shelves, and hopefully people enjoying it. And, and we hope you know, you're watching this video that you're enjoying our game. Now, I'm really excited. I think it's, people are really going to enjoy this game. I think they're going to uh, laugh in places. I think they're going to go cool in places. They're, they're going to be able to see things which they've never really done before in a first-person shooter. It's taken a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of TLC, but I think uh, you like where we've ended up. A lot of care and attention has gone into this game to make it a die-hard game like none other that's gone before. Some people have a knack for being in the right place at the right time. John McClane has a knack for being in the wrong place at the right time. McClane, don't try to stop me, Al. I was just gonna wish you luck. The reason why we made Die Hard, um, we already had a relationship with 20th Century Fox. And we were talking to them about the various licenses they had and what products we could work on. And we came to the conclusion that Die Hard was something that really excited us. We're huge fans of the film. Um, the game already existed on previous Die Hard films that did very well. But we just love the film. And we think even though it's a 14-year-old franchise, potentially, it's something that people always know. They still use the one-liners from the film. It, everybody remembers the films. It's classic. If you are a hardcore gamer, there's enough in here that's new, new controls, new scenarios, new puzzles, new ideas of gameplay that, that will keep you entertained and, and give you something different from a lot of games out there. In Die Hard Vendetta, you basically have three types of music. You have a atmospheric scary type, you have a stab, and you have a general action music. Uh, stabs basically correspond to very short instances of music that are either one note or a series of notes over a 20 second interval. This particular example here is when John McClane has set off the explosives and is trying to exit the, uh, the observatory. Uh, the explosives are timed exactly to when the music climaxes. So here we go. Now the music gradually gets a bit more intense, as you can hear the drums coming in now. And she's ready to blow. Now, hopefully, if you were successful, you'd be living through this and you'd be able to hear the tail end of the music. Otherwise, if you would have ran out too soon, you'd have been dead. The score to compose took about six to eight months. It took some time to actually get it, get it, the ideas in my head. Uh, so it gradually got faster as we got towards the end of the project. 
And when you start getting into detail where some themes are associated with some characters and situations, then it starts to get quite um, intense and dense. I mean, I had to write some about 67 pieces of music throughout the entire thing, variations of this theme, variations from that theme. It was very difficult. It was probably the most challenging orchestral thing I ever did. In one level, we may have up to, it's hard to tell, 30, 40 different people, different voices, different looks, different everything. We try to keep things as realistic as possible. One of the people we used in the game is, was Reginald Bell Johnson, who is the actor who played Sergeant Al in the films. And we were really fortunate to get him uh, because immediately you have the familiarity again and the connection with the films. In creating the sound effects that was required for the game, our sound engineer uh, would research from numerous libraries specific gunshot sounds and um, uh, explosion sounds, real world sounds. At the same point, he would improvise a lot of sound effects. I really wanted to add drama, mainly. Drama and I wanted to shake the player. Ah, my eyes! It ties in with the movies quite nicely because the movies are very orchestral and very big and spectacular, monumental. Um, and so I tried to do that with the music. I tried to get away from it, the repetitive nature of video games. We wanted to have a very strong lead character for the, for the player to relate to and associate with. Uh, and we were working with our publisher, who's 20th Century Fox, and they obviously had uh, numerous licenses available to them. And one of them was Die Hard. Now, Die Hard is, to everyone, one of the all-time classic action films. Um, it's one of the films that, even though it came out in 88, 20 years old or 15 years old, it actually hasn't dated. And if, you, if you look at it tomorrow, you know, it's got everything you want from an action film. Great set pieces, um, fantastic tension, brilliant dialogue. But also it's got one of the, the all-time classic heroes or anti-heroes in, in John McClane. And that was a very exciting character for us to try and translate into a video game. You get an attitude, uh, you get someone who you can relate to. He's not, he's not Superman, he's not some you know, character who can take out an army on his own. He's an everyday man who's a bit grumpy, a bit pissed off, which again makes him more human, um, but also he's very determined. And the challenge for us was to translate that into a video game.